Hello and welcome to Monday Night Calculus European Edition, uh, because we are certainly not in the evening here in the U.S. Um, thank you for taking time out of your day to join us uh, this afternoon or could even be morning for you over on the West Coast. Uh, really excited to be here for our last edition of Your Questions, Our Answers. Uh, Steve and Tom uh, have got a really great set of uh questions that they've kind of come in this over the last couple of weeks. And we're also looking to the AP exam here in a few weeks. So uh, looking to maybe give you guys some, some pointers and tips on that. So Steve, uh, I'll let you take it away. All right. Thank you very much, Curtis. I'm going to try to share my screen here. Let's see if we can get this to work. All right. How about that? Can you see that? Okay. I think that looks great. And just right. a reminder, if anybody has any questions or comments, or if Steve asks a question and I don't know the answer, I would <laughs> love to have you guys uh, out there in the, the chat put those, uh, put those solutions in the chat or any questions or things you want us to clarify on. Thanks, Curtis. Well, indeed, indeed we did see some really good questions on the uh, Facebook page over the last couple of weeks. And as we go through some of these, I think Tom and I are gonna try to point out or give you some extra tips here for when your students uh, take the AP exam. Some test taking strategies here that we might talk about. Um, I apologize, Curtis, I don't have a name to go with this one, but I, I picked this problem because I thought it was a little different, kind of a unique problem. Had a couple of different sort of questions in here, calculus questions. So I thought this one was pretty good. So we have this region R that is bounded by the graphs of F and the graph of G here, and this line T. So I've drawn a picture here and we can see this graph of F in blue. We can see the graph of F, uh, G over here in green. And this line T is actually tangent to both the graph of F and the graph of G at these points. It's tangent to the graph of F at this point, tangent to the graph of G at this point. So that's kind of a neat setup. I've got this region R shaded in. I think that's kind of a, a good illustration here. We're going to do several things with this region R. And the first thing we're asked to do here is to show that A is equal to B minus three. And I had to really kind of think about this one for a while. There's a lot of interesting associations and relationships, I think, going on in this graph, in this illustration. So here's how I started problem solving. Well, I, I know that there's this tangent line in there, and so I feel like I've got to use the derivative in some way. So the very first thing I did was I found the derivative of f, which will give me the slope of the tangent line at any point. I found the derivative of g, there it is, the slope of the tangent line at any point. Now I know that that tangent line must have the same slope at both of those points where x is equal to a and where x is equal to b. So I know that f prime of a has got to be equal to g prime of b. So I evaluated f prime at a, I evaluated g prime at b, and did a little simplification here, divided both sides by two. And in fact, I do have that relationship. That's kind of cool. Now, it seems like the next logical thing that we might want to do is, well, can we find the exact numerical values for A and B? Remember, we don't want to just estimate these by looking at the graph. We want to see if we can find the exact numerical value. So here's how I attack this. I try to find another expression for the slope of that tangent line T. And I did that by taking a look at, I'm going to try to scribble a little bit here. I did that by trying to take a look at the change in y divided by the change in x. And I'm sorry, Curtis, I'm going to arrow back up here. So I'm looking at these two points right here, and I'm going to take a look at the change in y divided by the change in x. So I have that correctly? I think so. Difference in y's divided by the difference in the x's. Now, I know that the slope of that tangent line t has got to be equal to the derivative. Whoops, sorry about that has got to be equal to the derivative of g at that point, or f at this point. So I could actually use either one of those functions, and I just, for the heck of it, chose g. So I know the g prime at b, which I know from up here, 
is 2b minus 6, has got to be equal to this expression. Well, I'm stuck a little bit at this step because if you look at that, it's one equation, but it's got two unknowns. But in part A up here, I have an expression for, well, 4A. And I use that down here. And some really cool stuff happens. If I've done everything correctly, the B minus three squareds cancel, the Bs cancel, Got a couple minus signs out in front, and I'm left with three over three or just plain one. So look what I have. I have two B minus six is equal to one. I can solve that one. And I've got a B equal to seven halves. Does that make sense in the picture? Yeah, it does. A little bit bigger than three. Kind of looks like it's a three and a half. So, okay. And now to find A, I can just go back to this expression once again. B was seven halves minus three. And I get a, A is equal to one half. That's pretty cool. I like that problem. We're not done. I just repeated this graph up at the top of this next page, Curtis, just so it would be a little bit easier for me to visualize and see what's going on. Part C isn't too bad at all. It asks for an equation of that tangent line T. And you know what? There's lots of ways that I can do that. Here's how I did it. I need a point and I need the slope. And I chose this point right here where A is equal to one half. I plugged one half into the expression for F or plugged it in right here. So there's a point and the slope at one half, well, we already knew that. It's the slope of that tangent line. We already knew that, that it was one. So it's pretty easy here to write an equation for the tangent line. Here it is, and here's a test-taking strategy. If you are asked for an equation of the tangent line, a tangent line, you can leave it in that form. Unless the question specifically says it must be put in a, well, special form, you can leave it like that. If you choose to go and write it a little bit differently, say, I don't want to know, say simplify, but maybe get Y all alone on one side of the equation. If you happen to make a mistake in simplifying some algebraic or even an arithmetic mistake, it is likely that you will lose that point. So that's a good test taking strategy. Well, now I'd like to find the area of that region R. Hmm. Okay, well, I'm going to leave a little bit to you guys, but here's what I did. I noticed that I'm going to have to split this region R up into two regions because from one half to seven halves, the upper curve or the high curve changes. So I'm going to have to split this up into two definite integrals. Over the first part, one half to two, the high curve or the upper curve is F and the lower curve is the tangent line. Now, here's another test-taking strategy. If we have functions defined, if functions have a name, you can certainly use that as you write a definite integral or as you write any equation with those named functions. If you choose to write out the actual algebraic or analytical expression for the function, and again, if you make a mistake, even if you have plugged it in correctly to your calculator and get the right answer down at the end, if you've made a mistake, a copy error, you will not get full credit. From two to seven halves, the high curve is g of x. The low curve is the tangent line. And again, I didn't go through and do this analytically, although that's something that you might want to check or try. And something very curious here happened. This first definite integral was 9 eighths. The second was 9 eighths. So what does that mean about this line, this vertical line at x equal 2? It actually cuts that region R up into two regions of equal area. That's pretty cool. That's often a question on the AP exam. Can you find, or at least write an expression to find this vertical line that cuts a region into two equal parts. So that's really cool. It's not really a backwards question, but that's kind of cool. And here's a challenge, one that you can do tomorrow morning with your students. Students, here's one you can work on tonight. 
let's suppose we take that region R and we revolve it about the line Y equal minus four. Can we find the volume of the resulting solid? So I'm gonna scribble just a little bit here. Okay, okay, I got a ruler, so I'm gonna to have to use it. Sorry about that, Curtis. Here's this line Y equal minus four. And what I want to do is I want to take this region R and I want to revolve it about that line Y equal minus four. I don't know if I can picture what that solid would look like. And try to find the volume of that resulting solid. Can you write an expression for that? And can you find that exact volume? Can you find an analytical expression to that exact volume? So that was a really nice problem. And uh, Tom, I think you have a, a couple of technology tips to share here on this one. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, just actually just some uh, nice illustrations uh, on uh, TI Inspire uh, okay. using this problem you just went over, Steve. Okay, all so yours. We'll, I'll stop sharing. There you are. Okay, and I'll share my screen. And you guys can give me some feedback if things are working okay here. Looks Look all right. Good. Yep, I see the okay. Inspire. All right, so um, on this document, I just went ahead and defined um, f of x and g of x as those two functions that uh, Steve was just talking about, x squared minus three and x minus three squared. And now let me get my, let me go over to the next page. And I went ahead and graphed those two parabolas, uh, like I said. And I've also put a point on each parabola and actually these uh, two points, this point here is the way I entered it was I just did a point by coordinate and I did, I put A comma F of A. Okay. And then because it saw an A, it made a slider for me. So I've got a slider for A comma F of A. Similarly, there's a point here on that second parabola and that's B comma F of B. So I've got these movable points and I can control them with the slider. So you can see I'm moving that point A, comma F of A, ground. I'll move it back to where I had it. And I can do the same thing with that point B, G of B. Okay. So I thought, just thought it might be interesting to go ahead and do some tangent lines that are actually dynamic on these two parabolas and just uh, try to confirm um, what we were seeing in Steve's picture. Uh, so to do that, I, I'm gonna go ahead and define a couple more functions. The functions will be the formulas for those two tangent lines. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'm gonna pull up my uh, graph entry line. I'll make F3, I'm gonna make that the tangent line to uh, the graph of y equal F of x at A comma F of A. Now I think Steve came up with a slope of two times a, and that would be of course times x minus a. And if we plugged in a, we'd get zero here, but we wanna get an f of a for our y value. So I'll add f of a. And that should give us a tangent line to that blue graph at that point. Ah, oh, looks good, there it is, all right. And so now when I move A, change the value of A, that tangent line is gonna move along with me. Looks good. Now I just wanna do the same thing with uh, this B comma G of B. So let's do that again. Now four, let's see, I think that slope is two times B. Right. Oops, there we go, two B minus six. Correct. Yeah times, of course, x minus b, and then we'll add on g of b. And that should give us a nice tangent line. Ah, there it is, okay. And I just wanna kind of confirm here, let's see, I think, Steve, you said that when we got to a equal, was it one half? Yes, sir. Well, let's go over to a equals positive 0.5. Now, a couple of things we can already see eyeballing it. It looks like it's tangent to that graph uh, of y equals g of x. But what I want to do is also move b to that point and see if those tangent lines then match up.
Uh, 3.5, yeah, as you said, B was going to be equal to three plus the value of A. So that's really looking nice. And so it's just kind of a nice way to verify. I'm not calling this in an analytical method. It's actually more of a, a visual check to see if our analytic work was, was correct. And by the way, I, I'm using a TI Inspire CAS here, but everything I've done here, you could do on a numeric TI Inspire. This is, none of this is requiring computer algebra at all. Okay. Uh, that's about all I got on this one, Steve. I'm going to turn it back over to you. Okay. This is where I always, uh, let's see, fumble. Let's see. I will stop the share and there we go. It's back to you. Okay. Fantastic. Well, Curtis, there were actually an awful lot of questions this past couple of weeks on area volume problems. So I'm going to do another one. And this is kind of a good one. And there's, a, there's some, uh, I think, test taking tips in here too. So we're going to let R be this region enclosed by the graphs of G. G has a trig function in it. And H is once again a parabola. Uh, enclosed by those two graphs, the y-axis on the left here, if I'm looking down a little bit at this picture, and on the right by the vertical line x equal 2. And this, this problem was, uh, I think, asked by Mark Wilson. I think I've got that correct. So the very first thing here is, let's see if we can find the area of this region R. Well, over this interval here, from zero to two, the high curve doesn't change, it's H. The low curve doesn't change, it's G. So the definite integral is pretty easy to write. And once again, let me remind you that these functions, if they're named in the statement of the problem, if they're named in the free response question, you can certainly use their names as you write out this mathematical expression. And just as an aside, we have seen an awful lot of area volume questions recently that have been actually calculator active. So they've been problem one or two. And so often what you have to do here is to simply set up the definite integral, write the mathematical expression, here it is, and then go directly to your calculator, plug in everything and return an answer. And that's sufficient for full credit. Well, okay, in this particular one, I thought for the heck of it, these aren't too bad. I'm gonna do this one analytically. There's my function H, there's my function G. Do you know how to take the antiderivative of all this term by term? I think so. This is pretty easy, that's a six X. Going from here to here to get that antiderivative. Well, I guess in my weird way of doing things, that's a U substitution. I know that many of your students are really good at all this stuff and can just look at that and see that antiderivative and that's terrific. There are two negative signs here. So this is gonna be a plus two X. And this is actually a U substitution, a very simple U substitution, isn't it? And I know that many students look at this and I remember doing this actually when I was in college too. Many students will look at this kind of an antiderivative and say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, to find an antiderivative, I need a constant pi over two out as, as part of that integrand. So I'll multiply by two over pi out in front, multiplying by one in a convenient form. And I often see questions on the Facebook page about, well, is that allowable? Can students do it that way? And yes, they certainly can. That's fine. So I'm going to find that antiderivative. I'm going to plug in the upper bound. I'm going to plug in the lower bound. There's a little bit of simplification here. And I think the answer is 44 divided by three. I don't know whether Tom's gonna do this or not, but I believe that if you are using a CAS machine and you were to plug this into your calculator, I believe without any decimal points in there, stray decimal points, you'd, act, you'd actually come back with that 44 divided by three, that exact, that exact answer, which is absolutely amazing to me. All right, let's try another one here with the same <laughs> excuse me, region R. Let's suppose that the base of a solid S is this region R and cross sections of the solid S perpendicular to the X axis are rectangles. So a little different here, rectangles with height one third the length of the base. So, all right, I tried to draw one in here. Whoops, where did that come from? Huh? I tried to draw one in here. So here's a rectangle and here's the base here right in there. And there's the height coming up from the screen. The height is one third the length of the base. Well, 
okay, this isn't a, a solid of revolution. And so what I need to do is think about that general formula for the volume of a solid here. And I have to find an expression for the area of the cross section. I did not write this in here yet, but I'll sneak it in here. So at an arbitrary point X in the region, can you figure out the area of that cross section? Well, it's the area of a rectangle. It's length of the base is right here, right? H of X minus G of X. It's okay that G is below the X axis. That's okay. And let's see the height. Well, that's one third the length of the base. So a cross section is right there. There's a cross sectional area, excuse me, right there. Now, some students, when they see this, when they work out something like this, think automatically, instinctively, that there must be a pi in here, or there must be a square root of three over two in here. And that's not necessarily the case. All I've got to do, all I've got to do now to find the volume is take the integral, definite integral from zero to two, that's how X varies over this region, of A of X. There's the one third out in front. I'll leave a little bit of this analytical stuff to you. But I think when I did this with the CAS machine, wow, I got 1759 over 45. And if you needed a numerical answer, I think there it is. Pretty cool. All right, I'm going to try one more problem with this region R, and then I'll let Tom try a little bit more technology. Let's suppose we take that region R and we revolve it about the line Y equals six. Find the volume of the resulting solid. I don't have my little arrows or curly arrows in here, but I'm taking this region R and I'm revolving it about that line Y equals six. In fact, that line Y equals six is just tangent to that graph of Y equal H of X. And here's the way that I do this. I find my axis of revolution and I'm gonna draw in a line that represents the outer radius. There it is. I'm gonna draw in a line that represents the inner radius. Both of those lines are perpendicular to the X axis. So in my way of thinking about this, I know that I need to find this volume with respect to X. I need to integrate with respect to X. Can I find an expression for that outer radius? Well, let's see, it's gonna be the distance from here down to here. Well, that would be six minus G of X. Okay, got that. It's gonna be six minus G of X. And this little distance right in there, that's gonna be six minus H of X. That's a minus sign right in there. So, okay, the expression for the volume, there's a pi out in front. How does X vary over the region of interest? Zero to two of the bounds. Here's R sub O squared minus R sub I squared. I'm gonna scribble a little bit down below this. A common error is, and I'm gonna scribble this out right away as soon as I write it. A common error is to write R sub O minus R sub I squared to put that square in the wrong place. And that, of course, is not correct. Be careful when you're writing this. Be careful when you're writing this expression. Make sure that you have the proper number of left and right parentheses. Make sure you close all the parentheses. And again, I think what I did is I plugged this into my calculator, my CAS machine. I got a 677 pi over 5. Boy, that's a, it's kind of a big solid. And there's the decimal approximation. I think those are really good problems that you could start out tomorrow morning with. Uh, good review problems as you get ready for the exam. I think Tom and I would agree that most likely there'll be an area of volume question on the AP Calc exam in May. I think this is a good review. Tom, a little bit of technology here? Sure, Steve. Okay. All right. I'm all yeah. yours. Share my screen again this time. and. Uh... I'm going to go ahead and uh, switch over to uh, TI-84. Okay. And again, Got it. let me know if we're seeing that okay. All yep. right. Um, so uh, really a good thing to do. We're provided with a graph here uh, right on the uh, question. 
you know, and on the exam, that's often the case. They'll show you a graph of that, that region uh, between the two curves. But even with that the case, um, I th it's really useful, I think, in terms of using your calculator. And, and these area volume problems very, very often are on the open calculator part of the exam. Uh, is to go ahead and, and graph those things again. And the main reason I would like to do that is as much as anything is to get those functions stored away once and for all as a Y1 and Y2. Now from now on, I can refer to those as Y1 and Y2, and it really uh, saves some error, you know, provided I didn't make an error in my original entry here. But one of the ways I can check that is to actually graph it. So let's see, I think I've got these entered in correctly, but now I wanna graph. I'm gonna go ahead and try a zoom uh, decimal window. And yeah, I can see that's actually not the best window. And that's where I could take a little bit of a cue from the graph that Steve provided in the question. Uh, it looked like it, um, the Y values went from about negative, well, lower than negative four. So I'm gonna go ahead and set the window. Uh, and the region that we're interested in is kind of in here where those two graphs uh, intersect. So let's go ahead and uh, do the following. Let's go to our window. I'm gonna set my X min to negative one. My X max, let's make that uh, four, or actually just three, I think. Let's try that. That's pretty close, I think, to what was shown on Steve's graph. Yep. We'll leave the X scale as one. And then for the Y man, let me go down to negative five, because it looks like that it went a little bit off screen. Yep. And let's at least go up to, uh, this is probably healthier than I need. I'm going to go ahead and do a Y max of seven, because so we have a little bit of space there. Y scale one looks good. Let's graph it again. Oh, I just barely had enough there, right? <laughs> uh, but now this graph is looking a whole lot like Steve. So I, part of the, that is I'm, I'm now more confident that I actually do have those entered in correctly. But I think the biggest thing is now when I'm doing calculations, I can just refer to my Y1. So my Y1 is uh, playing the role, it's that blue graph. Right. And that's the, uh, our G of X, and the red graph is our H of X, that's that parabola, okay? So if I go to the calculation screen, and let's just kind of do one, one of these uh, was the, um, just the straight area of that region that runs from zero to two. Uh, let's go to our math menu. And I see down there, FN int, looks good. Ah, and it actually comes up with this nice integral symbolism. I'm gonna do an integral from zero to two. And let's see, the parabola was on top, so that was Y2. So I'm gonna just go to my Y variables, get my Y2. And minus y1. And then we're integrating with respect to x. And 14 and 6, let's see, that's 14 and 2 thirds. If I did a little improper Good. fraction calculation, I think that's that 44 thirds that Steve came up with. And uh, I, I would emphasize that on the exam, you would want to write on your paper the, the H of X minus G of X here, okay? Um, but I know that that's my Y2 and Y1. And, and by the way, if, uh, even if those weren't already labeled, G of X and H of X, if they gave you a couple of formulas, uh, you could label them. H of X and G of X, and then refer to them from there on out as those functions, as long as you declared them, uh, because they certainly allow that on, on the, in grading the AP exam, All right? Now I'm going to uh, see if I can do this slickly or not. I'm going to stop share and then reshare. Hey, I have a question, Tom, on this Absolutely. one. Absolutely. 
before you leave this, would you go back to the graph screen just for a moment? Yeah, sure. Could you show us how to find that exact same calculation on the graph screen? Okay, let's, yeah, let's give that a shot here. That's going to be, um, you'll see that the second, the shift of trace, there's a calc. Yeah. Brings up our calculation menu. And at the bottom there, there's an integral. Mm -hmm. um, but that, see, that's the integral of. I think that's what I want to. Straight f of x. Yeah, right. So, is there any way to do this on the graph screen, Curtis? Tom? Well, in the following sense, what you okay. could do is you could go back to your y equals. Yes, and define a difference. Y3, make that equal to your. Y2 okay. minus your Y1. Okay. Graph that. Okay. That's the difference. Okay. And now, if you did your calc menu, okay. you could calculate the integral. I'm going to hit number seven. Okay. And let's see, I want to change which graph. I want to be on that black graph. Yeah. Okay, okay. Ah, uh, there we go. Y3 equals Y2 minus Y1. It says, okay. what's the lower limit? Well, I'll put in zero. Okay. And the upper limit, I'll put in two. Okay. Hey, how about that? And there we go. Uh, but I don't know, you know, unless there's a slick way to do it that I'm not aware of. I, I don't think you can do that area between two curves okay. like you can on, uh, like, for example, the Inspire. So, Tom is, or Curtis, is there any advantage or disadvantage to doing a definite integral on a graph screen versus a calculator screen? In other words, should, should they always return the same value? Is there yes. any chance of a numerical uh, approximation anywhere? Okay. Nope. So it really, really they does matter. Okay. Same, good. same functionality. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. I, I think that's important. Yeah. Uh, because and I would say, Steve, that uh, you know, especially given the other integrals that you're working with. Yes. You're going to have a lot more latitude using the calculator screen. Oh, I agree. There, because yeah. for any of those to do them on the calculator. Uh, on the graphic screen, you would have to define a function yeah. that was that integrand. Okay, so there'd be a lot of re-entry of on yeah. that part. Yeah, that'd be painful. Okay, thanks, yeah. Tom. That was cool. Very cool. Um, I'm going to do a quick shift over to the Inspire, if that's all right. Sure. Uh, so I'll stop sharing and then uh, flop over to the TI Inspire. And I did a similar thing here. I, I just went ahead on a notes page. I defined um, my G of X and H of X that were in the, the problem there. Uh, rather than graph it, I was going to just kind of do those intervals again and see the difference between a symbolic integral and a numerical integral. So let's try that out. I'm going to do a menu here and calculations, I think. We want to try calculus. And we want to do an integral. And let's see, what was that again? It was zero. We're doing the area again? Yeah. Yep, zero to two. Oh, let's go up there. There we go, two. And let's see, this is going to be our h of x um, minus right. our g of x. So I'm just typing that in, just like you would using the keyboard here. And then we'll arrow over and put in our variable of integration as X. And let's see what we get. Oh, we actually get that nice symbolic fraction there. Very cool. A um, Couple of things here, if um, I think, well, let me go ahead and go back to the menu and do calculations again. Again, go into calculus. 
And it looks like that arrow down at the bottom says there's more stuff down there. Let me go down there a little further, see what we've got. Oh, we, let me go back up here. Numerical calculations. Ah, numerical interval. We see number three there. So let me go ahead and hit that. So I've got a numerical interval. And for that, let me put in my limits of integration. My integrand. And my variable of integration. Oh, let's see. I think I might have got those. Could it be that the function goes in first or maybe not? It could be. I think that's exactly what I did wrong there. I sometimes forget what order these need to go in. Let's try that, see if that works. Oh, I've got them in the wrong order again. Uh, you, I think it's maybe. Uh, Curtis, do you know what I'm doing wrong here? I think it's uh, X, X zero to two. Oh, the variable, it goes right here. I that's think, the, that's I think. Easy. Yep, sorry about that. And we need one more comma in there. How about that? Okay. Let's see. We do all the <laughs> permutations, we'll get it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what's so nice about the, uh, now the thing is, this is exactly the kind of, it's a numerical integral that the TI-84 is doing but it does give you that integral template. So I don't have to, which, you know, which argument comes in which order. You can see I kind of fumbled around here until I got those in the right order. And so the right order for the arguments on this line are the integrand, variable of integration, and then your two limits. Okay. All right, Steve, I'll stop there and turn it back okay. to you. Very good, thank you. All right, let's see if that works. Here we go. All right, well, here's a good question too that involves a limit. This was posted by Cheryl Robertson, I think. And I think, again, there's some good test taking tips in here too. Let's see if we can find a limit as X goes to zero of this expression. So the first thing we notice here is we're gonna take a look at the limit of the numerator and the limit of the denominator separately. And so as X goes to zero, the tangent, or pardon me, this argument is going to zero. The tangent of zero is darn it zero. As X goes to zero, well, this is actually a product, right? So this expression is going to zero, this expression is going to one, but the product therefore is going to zero. So this is an excellent candidate for L'Hopital's rule. Let me sneak back up at the top here and just remind you of something. Um, at least the past couple of years, and we don't, want any, we don't know if anything's gonna change this year, but the last couple of years, students cannot write something like this. If they write that that is equal to zero over zero, if that equal sign appears in there, they will not get credit. That's taken right now, viewed right now as an inappropriate mathematical expression. Now that's true on the AP exam, not necessarily true in my class, but on the AP exam, we don't want your writing equals zero over zero. What do you do? You have to attack or, or look at both of these limits, the limit of the numerator and the limit of the denominator. You have to take a look at them separately. Do you have to write out that the limit now is in indeterminate form zero, zero? We can use the L'Hopital's rule. Not necessarily, but it would be really nice if you did so. Because generally the next thing we look for is evidence that the student has used L'Hopital's rule. What's the evidence? Well, that you have tried at least, conveyed, that you are trying to take the derivative of the numerator and the derivative of the denominator separately. I also want to remind you that you're trying to evaluate a limit. And until you evaluate that limit, make sure you drag along that expression. If you haven't done it yet, you got to drag along that sort of operation. How do you take the derivative of the numerator? Well, we're going to have to use the chain rule. The outermost function is the tangent. The derivative of that is secant squared. Derivative of the inner function is two. Okay, got that. Um, the denominator, well, that's a, a product. And I guess there are several ways to look at this, but I'll look at it as 3x 
times cosine of 4x. Derivative of the first function is 3 times cosine 4x plus 3x. Derivative of the next function of the second function, excuse me. Well, again, I got to use the chain rule. And I think there's a 4 times a minus sine of 4x in there. Well, now, fortunately, I think I can evaluate this limit. What's happening in the numerator? The secant. Let's see, wait a minute. This argument is going to zero. So the secant is going to one. The square is going to one. There's the extra two up there. And in the denominator, this is a constant three. That expression is going to one. And that's going to zero and that's going to zero. So we have a plus zero in there. So it certainly looks like this limit is two thirds. So I think what I've written on this page, bar this, I believe that that would get you full credit in the event that this were a L'Hopital's rule question on the free response portion of the exam. And again, I want to remind you, don't write equals zero over zero. Yes, there are some sneaky ways that you can get by here, perhaps with some arrows. But I think Tom and I still recommend that you take a look at both of these limits separately. Now, there was an alternate solution here posted by Mark Corrali, who is the moderator of this Facebook page. And I, and I don't think I would have thought about this one, but this is kind of cool. So I thought we should show you this. So let's see if I can get this straight here. Tom, don't let me make a mistake. So here's the original expression. Here's the original quotient. All right, I'm gonna split this up. There's the one over three X, I see that. The tangent of two X, I will write by definition, is the sine of two X divided by the cosine of two X. And my remaining term is in the denominator, so I've got a one divided by cosine of four X. Now, I guess there is, there's a good problem solving skill in here. I guess if you write it like that, you think about this limit. I'm going to scribble a little bit off to the side. You think about this limit that you look at when you first start to examine derivatives of trig functions. And you think about the limit as h goes to 0 of the sine of h divided by h. And you learn that that is equal to 1. And you learn that as long as these arguments are the same and they're both going to 0, that limit is 1. And so I see this 2x in here, and I think what Mark tried to do is get a 2x down in the denominator. So here's what he did. He brought this x over here. Sorry, Curtis, a lot of arrows. And then he multiplied by 1 in a convenient form, 2 over 2, to get a 2x in the denominator. Okay, so let's see if I've got everything here. Here's the 1 third. Here's this lonely 2. Here's the sine of 2x over 2x. I like that. Here's a cosine of 2x in the denominator. Here's a cosine of 4x in the denominator. Now, why is this good? Well, it's a giant product. And we can employ this uh, rule here for limits or a limit law. The limit of a product is the product of the limits, so long as all of the limits exist. Well, these are constants out in front. Hey, there's my 2 thirds. We know that the limit of this expression is one by this argument. There it is. And we have a one up here in the numerator. As x goes to zero, this is going to one. There it is. As x goes to zero, this is going to zero. That's going to one, one over one. There it is. And there's a real sneaky way to get that exact same limit of two thirds. So, so this, Steve, yes, sir. And another one. Sure, go ahead. Well, it's actually just a slight variation on Mark's okay. uh, really nice alternate solution. And that very first line where your arrow is, yes, um, you know your trig identities, the sine of 2x is 2 times the sine of x times the cosine of x. Okay. And now you already got your sine x over x. Ah, right. And you've got a 2 thirds yep. and everything else goes to 1. So you end up with two thirds. How about that? But it, uh, it's just a very slight variation on Mark's nice solution. There. Very clever. And so I think, Tom, this sort of begs that question. That we talk about this uh, frequently, I think. You know, sometimes there are several different ways to solve a problem. And on the scoring standard that's usually published on AP Central, 
generally, I think what we try to do is to put the most common solution there. But remember, as long as the student solves it using correct mathematics, most likely they will receive full credit. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Tom, did you have some technology here too? In my uh, room? Just a little bit. Yeah, sure, Steve. Okay. Okay. All right. There you go. Okay. All right, I'm going to go uh, and actually share my uh, TI-84 screen again. Okay. Um, and what I did was I, I went ahead and entered in Y1 uh, the function that we were taking the limit of in this particular problem. So I think it was tangent of 2x over the denominator of 3x times cosine 4x. So that's okay. that function. Got it. And once that's entered, uh, again, I, I would not um, suggest this as a uh, way to prove that a function has a particular limit, but it's just a way to do a reality check, and especially if you've done some analytic work like Steve did and you want to kind of see, well, does that really make sense, is to simply graph this function and look at how is it behaving near x equals zero. That's where our limit was as x approaches zero. So I'm going to go ahead and graph this. Uh, let me just out of the box do a zoom decimal window. That's where each hash marks worth one unit in both directions. Wow. Oh, man, this is busy. <laughs> oh, and it's because of that cosine 4x in the denominator. So every time that thing's zero, we're getting an asymptote there. OK. But what we're, we're interested in is around this, uh, where x equals zero. So this might actually be a nice place to use a zoom box. So let me do that. I'll do zoom box. And I can just draw a uh, little rectangle around this uh, area of interest here. So let me get over here a little bit. I'll hit enter. And then I'll go down to the right, just make sure I've got the area of the graph that I'm really interested in. Okay, so that's what we're gonna do is that's now gonna fill out the entire screen when I hit enter. Very cool. Fantastic, okay. So that's a really close up view of this graph. I don't know if you can see it, but there's actually no um, pixel lit up at x equals zero. It's actually undefined there. Now you might say, well, I'm seeing an x and a y, but that's just where my cursor is located. Let right. me go ahead and do a trace and you can see the y value is blank. That's because it's not defined there. But let me just go a little bit to the right. Ah, so just so. Notice I'm less than a 100th away, right? 0 0.008. The Y is 0.667, all right, that looks kind of familiar. Let me just go a little bit to the left of zero again. In fact, this thing's looking very symmetric, uh, at least near X equals zero. And so this is confirmed, I would say it's uh, supporting evidence. I'm not gonna say confirming evidence, but supporting evidence, yeah, that two thirds is looking really good. Uh, and I'm feeling a lot more confident that I haven't made any kind of uh, paper and pencil mistake when I see the limit is panning out like this. Um, and, and I just find this is a, a simple uh, reality check thing you can do with almost any limit problem is, is graph it and, and take a look at the behavior near that point. So, all right, I'll stop the share there. Okay. Hand it back to you. All right, here we go. Beautiful. Curtis, we haven't had the opportunity to do too many DC problems, but I thought we should do one today. So let's take a look at this one and see if we can determine whether this series is absolutely convergent, conditionally convergent, or divergent. This is kind of a nice one. Um, I've always felt that when in dealing with series and these types of questions, as in dealing with, say, trying to find just a, a regular old definite integral, you really need some good strategies or some good problem solving skills. Uh, many textbooks in fact have strategies for looking at convergence and divergence and strategies are for finding definite integrals or pardon me, indefinite integrals, any integral. 
So let's take a look at this one. The first thing I'm going to try to do is to determine if this is absolutely convergent. And as I take a look at the absolute value of a term, a general term, I look at that and here's how I'm thinking out loud. You know, as n increases without bound, as n gets bigger and bigger, that general term sort of looks like one over n. And so as I thought about this, it seemed like I wanted to consider, compare this in some way with this series, which is the harmonic series, which diverges. So what I tried was the limit comparison test. And what that means is I have to take a look at the limit as n goes to infinity of say a sub n divided by b sub n, the ratio of the terms. Well, I did that. I did a little bit of simplification here and I'm left with this expression. Now you can argue, I think, pretty, pretty easily that as n increases without bound, that nine doesn't mean much of anything in the denominator. And so the numerator and the denominator here are looking very similar. And so that limit is indeed one. And in fact, if you wanna solve that, we can divide both top and bottom by n squared if we want to do a little bit more analytically, and we can see that that limit is one. So that means here, what is the, what is the conclusion using this limit comparison test? Because this limit exists here, that means both of these series either diverge or converge. Well, again, we know that this is the harmonic series, and we know that that diverges. So we know the series of absolute value terms here must also diverge. So conclusion, it's not absolutely convergent. Cool. So Steve, uh, yes, sir. if I jump in there for just Please. a little bit. Please. So all of that stuff you just said that was not on the page is yes. stuff you really want to say on the test if you're arguing this way. You okay. want to go through and say, oh, okay, now these two things have the same behavior. Right. Harmonic series diverges, therefore this series diverges. And so the absolute value version doesn't uh, converge and it's not absolutely convergent. So. Excellent point. Yeah. Yep. All right, well, let's see here. Can I look at conditionally convergent? Well, what's gonna be true here? If it's gonna be conditionally convergent, what's gonna be true? Two things have to happen, right? Let me think about this for a minute. Well, the, the terms have to be decreasing and the limit of the terms has to be zero. Hmm. Well, how do I show that these terms, darn it, are decreasing? Well, you know, one thing you can do is you can take a look at f of n and you can take a look at f of n plus one and you can try to compare them. And sometimes it's pretty easy to see that f of n plus one is less than f of n. And I tried that off to the side, I couldn't see it very easily. So another common way to solve this is to think of this function and take its derivative. How do I take the derivative of that? Well, I've got to use the quotient rule. I did that and I did a little simplification. Is there anything that I can argue by looking at that derivative? Well, the denominator is always positive. I see that, that's got a square in it. What about the numerator? Oh, wait, 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 wait. As soon as n gets greater than three, that numerator is gonna be negative. So what does that say? The derivative of this expression, this function is negative so long as n is bigger than three. That means the terms in this sequence are decreasing as soon as we get to n equal four. And remember, when we're dealing with series sequences, we don't really care about the first few finite number of terms. We're only worried about what's going on in the tail end, infinitely many terms. So that's good. I've got them decreasing after a certain point. Can I take a look at the limit of that term, that expression? Yeah, that's pretty easy too. I divide the top and the bottom by n. I've got a one divided by this expression. And what happens as n increases without bound, this goes to zero. This increases without bound and drives the whole fraction to zero. And so I've got the two, mo I've got the two pieces here for this alternating series test. The terms are going to zero. The terms are decreasing. And therefore, this series is conditionally convergent. 
So that's a nice problem. That's a really good one. We haven't had the opportunity to do many series questions. Let me take a quick look, Is that, uh, if it's okay, at one more series question. Tom and I were just talking about this before we came on, Curtis. You know, this is another one that kind of screams out here. We want to know if this is simply convergent or divergent. And this one is kind of screaming out to use the root test. But Tom and I were kind of trying to think about, uh, have we seen a problem in recent years where you had to use the root test? And, and I'm not sure if we can think of one. But this is classic because in its expression, it has an expression, the term, the general term is raised to the nth power. So I believe in a case like this, it would be okay to use the root test. We take a look at the limit as n goes to infinity of this nth root of the absolute value of that expression. And this expression here just goes to one third, which is less than one. And that tells us that the series is absolutely convergent and therefore convergent. So kind of a quick problem using the root test, but we'll leave as a challenge can you show that in any other way? Can you show that with any other comparison test, any other way to find that that series is convergent? Since we're near the end, Curtis, maybe we can just set up one of these problems here. I think that's we fine. We've got a couple a minutes. Problem, if that's okay. So here we have the graphs of the polar equa equations R equal three. Uh, R equal three is the graph of a circle. So that's this one right here. That's R equal three. And R equal four minus two times the sine of theta, that's the curve that's in blue. And you can probably guess I'm gonna be interested in that shaded region. I'm, I'm telling you, although this might be something that you would try to confirm, but I'm telling you that these two graphs intersect at theta equal to pi over six and theta equal to five pi over six. So I'm gonna do my best to draw in a straight line here. If I draw that line in there, there's a theta equal to pi over six. If I draw another one in over there, that angle is five pi over six. So one of the first things you might try to do here is to find the Area of that region R, I think that's a good question. There's lots of symmetry in here. Uh, we're certainly gonna post these answers, but uh, that's one that I think you should think about. Think about all the symmetry in here and, and think about the area of the region that's below the x-axis. That looks like half a circle. So you might be able to use that in some way. And here's a couple of other interesting questions. We've seen some questions, oops, I'm sorry about that, like this on the exam recently. Oops, I'm sorry, I'm back there at number one, part A, here's B. Suppose a particle is traveling along this curve so that at time t, theta is equal to t squared, and we're interested for t between one and two. Find the value of t when dr dt is equal to one. This is kind of a neat question. It involves the chain rule. This is probably absolutely a calculator active question. So that's a good one to think about. Um, using the chain rule, you'll have to find also dr d theta and d theta dt. And there's one other good one in here, I think in part C. Everything's working, there it is. So for this particle and particle motion described in part B, can we find the time, find the time t with the x coordinate as position minus one? And then once we find that time t, find the velocity of the particle at this time. Be careful, this is particle motion in two space here. So this is a, a BC question. So the velocity is actually a vector here, not a scalar. And this is a question where you will have to, here's a calculator, one last calculator or, or exam tip. When you find a value like this that is sort of an intermediate numerical value that you're gonna to have to use later on, remember the best advice that we can give you is to write it on your paper to three decimal places, but store it to the greatest degree of accuracy allowed by your technology. Store it in a variable like A or B somewhere in your calculator and use that in other calculations, use that much more exact value than rounding or trunking. Fantastic, thank you, Curtis, that's all I got.
That was well, a that's... lot of fun. Some great questions today. Thanks yeah, for we had some good everything. ones. We had some good questions today. That was really, really great. Well, I have a couple of uh, a couple of shout outs to do. Um, okay. You'll recall uh, Mr. Stephen Beck uh, yeah. that we did a uh, session with uh, a few weeks ago. We had uh, several students log in and want to make sure that he uh, got a, uh, a shout out at the end of this session. So I want to make sure that uh, I call out uh, to him. And secondly, I'll put my email address in the chat if it's not already. Um, and you can uh, certainly send me any teachers out there looking for uh, the professional development uh, hours. You can certainly send uh, me an email and I'll set you up with a link to download a certificate for uh, attendance of this session. Um, and we really enjoyed doing this this year. This is our final Monday night calculus, even though it's Monday afternoon. Uh, <laughs> session for the spring, but uh, be looking for emails from Texas Instruments. We'll be uh, putting out some stuff and, and we'll start something up here uh, in the fall. So just enjoyed this season with you, Tom and Steve. Thanks, uh, thanks so much. And uh, we'll catch you guys on the flip side. Thank All you. right. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks, Curtis.